Okay, um, well we're so fortunate to have Sandy Kite with us this afternoon to do um, the oral history of her time in German Village. I believe Sandy um, has said that she came to the village in the late 60s and uh, we're going to learn about her experience over the almost um, maybe 45 years or so. Sandy, welcome and thank you so much <laughs> thank for, you. for um, participating with us. I often wonder how it happened that I so quickly got so old to be considered someone to tell of the history in German Village. Uh, yeah, I, I came to German Village in the late 60s, and I lived in the Double, which is on 3rd Street, across from the Schwartz Castle. That was my first solo apartment. And the Schwartz Castle, can you tell us what that was? <laughs> <laughs> At the time, the Schwartz Castle was um, actually more of a rooming house or boarding house than anything else. Um, it uh, was habitated by some interesting characters. One in particular, I recall, was a Greyhound bus driver. And I think the photographer is here. <laughs> okay. Remember, Hallie is a runner. Okay. Um, it was habitated by, uh, as I said, several different kinds of interesting characters. And um, the rooms inside were individually padlocked on the doors. Wow. When the um, rumors would leave, they would lock the outside of the door with the padlock. And when they would be home, they would lock the inside of the door with a padlock. I recall when my parents first came to visit me, and I was very anxious and excited to um, show them my apartment. And they came from Chicago, which is where I grew up, and parked their car in front of the double. And my father got out of the car and stood in the middle of Third Street and turned around and around and around and looked at the Schwartz Castle and the people who were sitting there and blurted out loudly, my God, girl, what did you do, move into Skid Row or something? <laughs> well, that deflated me a little bit. But nevertheless, um, following that period of time, uh, two gentlemen, Bob Geese and Bob Eckel, purchased the Schwartz Castle and uh, did renovation. And ever since then, it has remained a very nice um, marker for entering German Village. Um, and can you give just a little description of what the Schwartz Castle looked like then and what as compared to what it looks like now? Well, at that time, um, there was um, a gas station on the corner instead of the large commercial building which stands there now. And so there, the gas station being a very low, single kind of uh, building um, allowed Schwartz Castle to be very showy in its architecture. So it was, um, it had a lot more character that was visible at, at that time than we can now see of the castle. And so um, you were describing how the, uh, um, the Schwartz Castle had, had its grand, sort of grand stature when you first moved in, but um, changed by the people who were living there at the time. And it sort of sent your folks into awe uh, as to, where, where had you moved? Um, yes. And can you think, remember exactly what year that was that you came? I think it was 1966, perhaps. I don't know. I don't remember exactly, but that's pretty close. Okay. Um, at the time, I was still single, and um, some girlfriends and I would gather at our apartment because another friend, another girlfriend, lived in the other half of the double. And um, it was a popular thing to do at that time uh, to subscribe to Gourmet Magazine and try out all of those exotic, wonderful recipes. So we would have our little dinner parties on weekends and uh, the castle always fascinated us. And I remember um, a few times we had had our dinner and a little bit of wine. And so we were getting a little bit feisty and um, it started some kind of a ritual for us in years thereafter because we would draw straws and the person with the short straw would have to run across the street, run into Schwartz Castle, 
run all the way up to the top floor, go to the window and wave to the rest of us downstairs, <laughs> run all the way back down and get home safely. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. And how long did you live in that apartment there on Third Street? Until 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that time I bought a small house on the corner of Alexander and Purdy Alley. It was a house that had just been uh, renovated by Bob Geese, who was someone in the village who, he was one of the first to do any number of renovations. Um, and I lived next door to a very grand lady. Her name was Sensi Staley, and she was the child of German immigrants. And she went to St. Mary's School at the time that St. Mary's was taught in German, and all of their textbooks were German. So since he had a bit of a German accent, and she was quite a character and had quite a sense of humor. And um, in 1977, when my husband and I were married, we moved into this home here on Beck Street and invited Sensei to come see our new old house, which needed to be renovated. But nevertheless, Sensei stepped into the front door and said, I was born in this house. Oh my goodness. And so she was able to tell us a lot of early history about things um, that uh, transpired in this house and how it came to be that no one else would have been able to tell us. She lived here with her aunt and uncle, they owned the home, and her mom and dad. And the dining room, she said, had a very long dining room table with 12 chairs. And every weekday, there would be 12 brewery workers who would come here for lunch carrying their buckets of beer. Mm -hmm. And they would be seated around that large table while she and her mom and her aunt served them lunch. Oh, wow. So that was a good bit of history. Yes, well, was her uncle a brewmaster? Or that I don't know. I do know that the house was actually built by an Italian carpenter, an Italian bricklayer, which is the reason that it has such an Italianate look to it in the front of the house. Not pure, but it, it has, it's reminiscent of Italianate. Um, and so you're describing how you were started out on 3rd and then you moved to Purdy Alley and then came over to Beck Street um, and now you're you're still here. I know you did, you said you did several renovations um, in the time that you've lived here in German Village. Can you talk a little bit about those? Um, in addition to doing this house, um, we purchased the old Langstone uh, Company on the corner of Jackson and 5th Street. But when we moved into this house, um, we had a lot of weeds in the backyard and nothing really growing and a lot of rubble and we began digging it out to make a garden and found a lot of scrap iron. And one of the things that Sensi Staley was able to tell us was that the people who owned the house before um, had a blacksmith shop in the back, what is now the backyard. And so that gives the reason for all of the iron rubble that we dug up while trying to make a garden happen back there. And um, over time, we built a pergola where we're now sitting uh, with wisteria. And uh, once we got tired of that, we decided that we would build a solarium, which is about 15 years old now, I would say. And it was designed by Bill Hugus, resident architect in German Village, and Klaus Gauer, resident contractor in German Village. Mm -hmm. And it has served very nicely over the years. We found that we didn't feel it necessary to run away from Columbus every January and February. We were able to enjoy being out of doors without being outside. And, um, enjoy it very much also in the spring and the summer. Great. So maybe we'll stop right here and let John. Okay. So are you anxious to see who keeps coming to your people? <laughs> yeah, you have so many I wonder who that was. <laughs> we, we Thank you, Butler. Right here, John, just to <laughs> see who else is coming. And if someone dropped off a gift for you. Oh, oh that's nice. Thank you. Yeah.
It tasted really good. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take over here, book? I don't need to be here. Oh, no. Did sure. you put it up high enough that Miss Halley wouldn't get to it? Pardon? Did you put the gift, if it's edible, up high? I really don't know if it's edible, but it's up. It's up Thank you. Because she once ate a gift of um, ganache chocolate and had to be rushed oh, to yeah. emergency right away. Yeah, chocolate's not good for puppies. Is it okay if I put it mm -hmm. on? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so you were describing uh, the renovations that you did here at the house and, and about the iron artifacts that you found out uh, back. Are there any that you ended up keeping and using in different, in your art or? Um, there's one piece that's in our front garden in the summertime and it uh, looks like it would have been sort of like a finial kind of object on an iron fence or something like that. But I'm sure that a lot of the iron fencing that exists today in German Village might have had its birth right here in the backyard in that blacksmith shop. So you live in a black in a former blacksmith shop, um, or at least it was out back, and then you bought a building that belonged to Langstone. Um, can you talk a little bit about about that building? Uh, certainly, in the the building that was um, originally uh, constructed by Langstone Company. Uh, is the second building that they built there as their business. The first one was built in 1838, 1839, um, as far as I can remember, and it was much like a, a wooden barn structure. And the parking lot that exists now um, was the dumping grounds for all of the slabs of stone that they would have brought in. Sometime in the 1930s, that building burned down and in its place they built a cinder block building. It's a single room, windows on all four sides, and it's actually cinder cinder block. It's not the, the current type of cement block that we know to be. But it serves perfectly as my art studio because of having the windows on all four sides. The light is just great. It's not very large. It's about 20 feet by 25 feet in size, so I can't take too many things in there. I have to um, use my space wisely. So um, I can do small prints with a small etching press in there and paint and do my uh, jewelry from recycled materials there and my clothing from recycled fabrics there. And it suits me quite nicely. In the summertime, we have farm market there. It's, we've had it for 14, 15 years in the parking lot every Saturday morning. And um, it's kind of a nice gathering spot on the weekend for the German villagers to come and get produce that is grown without any chemicals added. And that is done by farmer John Falk and his partner Clint Beardsley. Clint Beardsley is the owner of uh, Metroscape Horticultural Landscape Services. Mm -hmm. And he uh, designed the property here on the Beck Street house, as well as the gardens at the studio space on Jackson and Fifth, and has maintained them uh, ever since. Oh, great. Um, so in coming to German Village in the late 60s, can you think about um, and you've already mentioned a number of changes that have occurred. Can you can you think about some other changes that um, have occurred over the time that you've been here? Well, definitely when I first came here, there was no sense of community whatsoever. It took uh, Frank Fetch and Fred and Howard and loads of other people like Phil and Shirley Keats and my uh, former neighbor Dorothy Fisher and her husband Ralph who lived next to the double um, across from Schwartz Castle. There was no com sense of community at all, and over the years it evolved with a great de deal of volunteerism. And of course, the German Village Society today depends greatly upon uh, volunteerism to keep our society going and to keep our village um, growing more and more as a closely knit community. Yeah, so you were here during the early days of the a German Village Society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What memories do you have of that? We, um, we had an art league 
Well, we've had more than one art league over the mm. years. Um, artists tend to be pretty loose organizers, <laughs> and so they don't hold things together very well. And so um, one art league after another has come and gone over the years. But our first art league was a small group of people, and it was not only visual artists. It included uh, writers, poets, um, musicians. Dorothy Fisher was um, a poet who was a member. Phil Keats was a painter who was a member. Um, Mary, Mary Kay and John Carter are musicians. They were members. And after a while, it became um, obvious that none of us really wanted to take on the responsibility of planning everything, organizing everything, installing all of our shows, and and creating the social events to bring people out to see our work and, and experience our work. So we decided that rather than um, falling apart grudgingly, we would celebrate the end of our time together. And so we had a bonfire in the backyard of what was at the time the German Village Society Meeting House. It's now the home of um, Tom and Nancy Gross. Mm -hmm. um, we had a bonfire in the back and we each contributed something to keep the bonfire going. I threw in an, a canvas that I considered to be a <laughs> failure. Um, Dorothy read a poem that she could never get quite together and threw that into the fire and so on and so forth. Mary, Mary Kay and John threw in a score that they could never quite get to work right and then afterwards of course being um, true blue German villagers we went inside and celebrated with a bottle of wine. <laughs> That's a great story. And you said that the uh, Art League has been reincarnated a couple of times. That's right. Um, what memories do you have of those other times? Well, the second time we reached out a little bit into the um, contiguous areas, and into Marion Village and Schumacher Place and so forth, and tried to make our numbers grow a bit. And um, indeed, it made it more interesting. We met new people. Our monthly meetings of critiquing each other's work were quite successful, but again, no one was quite willing to keep the ball rolling. And so it fell apart just kind of like, oh, fading away. Mm -hmm. And there's a current art league that um, actually Ryan Orweiler started up some years ago. I'm guessing maybe five years ago, I could be wrong. And it still is in existence today. As a matter of fact, there's a show going right now at the German Village Meeting mm -hmm. House of um, members' work. And I think this time around, uh, it looks like it's going to make it. Oh, good. And it is, um, is it limited uh, to artists now to... Um, it's visual artists. Visual artists. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. changed over the years mm -hmm. in, in that regard. Yes. Oh, great. One of the things that uh, we had discussed earlier was about Third Street and how it's changed over the years. And I wonder if you have some recollections of how you've seen that changed. Um, Next to the double where I first lived um, is a commercial building. And in that building, there was an antiques shop called Mrs. Thompson's Antique Shop. And it lasted for quite a while. I'm guessing that it's only been maybe eight or ten years since that closed down after her death. But one of the f fun things that I recall about that shop was that um, every Christ Easter season, she would bring out her antique collection, vintage collection of hats, Easter bonnets, and filled the windows with... Um, with her collection of Easter bonnets, and uh, people would just stand around for, for a long time just admiring those hats and how they were made. And uh, of course, it was an attraction to go into her store, so that was helpful to her too. A lot of German village homes have things that have been exchanged from one house to the other via Mrs. Thompson's antique shop. Um, 
There was the Sausage House, Thern Sausage House, where Pistachia Vera currently is, and it was a gathering place. On Saturday mornings, about the only place to go for coffee was Jurgen's, and so we had Saturday morning breakfast rituals at Jurgen's with um, community members. I remember in particular Phil and Shirley Keats were always there, and there was a waitress there dressed in her German um, German outfit, her dirndl and so forth, and she was actually uh, from Germany. And she pretty much told us what we wanted to eat for breakfast each Saturday. <laughs> That's great. Ilga was her name. Yeah. Uh, so you're describing how the community was evolving, um, developing a, a sense of community from um, gatherings uh, it, with the Art League and on Saturday mornings, um, you're, you've described how you've ha hosted or, um, the uh, farmer's market on Saturday mornings for you said 14, 15 years mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. um, at your art studio. And What other changes in community building have you seen over time? Um, a lot of the homes have... Uh, I've been happy to watch a lot of the homes being renovated and um, we have more residents than we had. It was mainly renters at the time that I came mm -hmm. and it has been fun to watch people come and see the different the different ways they, they envision to renovate the homes and of course as we well know, a lot of the homes are a lot more contemporary than one would imagine looking from the outside because um, people have, um, well, they gut kitchens now and put in the granite and the formica is gone and the asphalt tiles are gone. Um, we no longer have hand pumps in the kitchens. In this property there was an outside pump um, right to the, to the outside of the solarium door here. Um, I imagine that the, the residents pumped their water from there and brought it inside mm -hmm. and all those kinds of changes have happened very gradually over the years. Uh, a lot of wonderful changes in the outside of design of the yards also while retaining the beauty of the old wrought iron, but a lot of contemporary things happening in the yard. Swimming pools, mm -hmm. outdoor kitchens these days, mm -hmm. uh, something that no one would ever have imagined uh, could happen in German Village. Actually, it's surprising to some people to know how many swimming pools there are in these small German Village yards. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so home ownership versus renting was instrumental in some of those changes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that people investing yes um, uh, do you re I can't quite remember when 7071 came in um, to Columbus but I if I remember correctly it was in the 60s um, were you here when that impacted uh, travel to German Village? Or? Actually, that happened um, shortly before I moved to German Village. However, I do remember before I-70, I-71 existed here because I uh, came to Columbus to, as a beginning teacher at Starling Junior High School on the west side in Franklinton. Mm -hmm. And I would um, get school buses to transport my art students to the area because there was the old Mohawk um, outdoor market. And it was a very colorful kind of environment for art students to draw and paint from. Um, the, the outdoor bins of fruits and vegetables stacked beautifully in patterns and uh, the children were very fascinated by the chickens hanging <laughs> by their <laughs> necks or their feet. <laughs> I don't remember how it was. And, oh my goodness, what, what are those things? Pug pig's knuckles. Oh my, that just <laughs> blew their minds. And so there was a lot of um, visual information for them to use for their ideas and their drawings and paintings. So that was my experience well before I moved into German Village. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what drew you here in the first place? 
Um, I lived in an apartment with um, a roommate in a nearby area, and I, at the time, was doing television programs for Columbus Public Schools and uh, COE TV, WOSU TV, mm -hmm. uh, doing art lessons for elementary grades because there were, at that time, no art teachers in the elementary grades. And because of that, um, I, be I became stalked by someone who enjoyed watching my, my children's TV programs. And I had to move from my apartment, finally. And I, th I just found this double in the classified ads, and I thought that would be really great because it would be closer to the Board of Education building downtown. Mm -hmm. So I moved into this double, and um, come to find out, I moved just a couple blocks away from <laughs> where the stalker lived. Oh. So it was, a, it was a long and involved story, but I stayed and um, have been happily ever after here. And I hope to stay here forever. Oh, great. You mentioned a, a number of people who have been influential in German village history. Um, the Fishers, um, one story that you, I wonder if you could share is about Ralph Fisher and his camera. Oh, yes. Uh, you rarely saw Ralph Fisher outdoors without a camera hanging around his neck. And he photographed building after building. Every time something new happened, he was photographing it. And consequently, he contributed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs to the German Village Society archives. And they've been very, very helpful in tracing back the history of German Village. And of course, he took photographs um, for the joy of taking photography as an artist mm -hmm. as well. So it ser his work served two purposes. Uh, Ralph and Dorothy adopted a dog from the Humane Society, which um, it was a black lab, I believe, but it was very feisty, very young and very feisty. And I recall walking the streets of German Village with Dorothy and Ralph and their dog because I had just taken my dog through training school and I was able to help them teach the dog how to heal and so forth. So Ralph got a lot of um, animal pictures and, and fun family things that way too. Dorothy's mother lived in a little tiny cottage house behind their house and I think she lived to be almost 100 years old. So Ralph and Dorothy cared for uh, her mother all those years. Dorothy was super volunteer woman, as everyone well knows, in German Village, and a very talented writer. Um, let's see, Phil Keats and Shirley Keats. Phil Keats's handiwork is represented in this house on Beck mm -hmm. Street. He built um, the first brick sidewalk in our backyard and he redesigned the brick wall that was around the, the pergola space that I spoke of before. He um, installed the two windows that are in the living room on the east wall. It was a solid wall when we moved in, and the house was rather dark as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who owned the house before us had installed a, a leaded beveled glass transom above the double front doors. And so Phil Keats and Mr. Helft from Franklin Art Glass and I designed windows to be installed on that east wall uh, to repeat um, the visual essence of the, the beveled leaded glass wind, transom window above our front doors. So Phil uh, knocked out the brick wall and Mr. Helft designed and created the windows and Phil put the windows in, but by the time it was all done, everything in our house upstairs and downstairs was orange. Orange from the orange brick <laughs> dust. <laughs> our pillowcases were orange when I first came home from work that first day. But it, it turned out to be well worth the, um, well worth the grief that cleaning up uh, was caused. Also, when we renovated uh, in the early 80s, um, the two bathrooms and um, partially the kitchen 
it was done while my husband and I were both still working full time. And the contractor at the time tore out both bathrooms before realizing that the ceramic tile that was ordered for them was someplace between Denmark and here floating around on the ocean in a boat. And they didn't know where it was or how long it would take for it to come. So my husband and I had to go every morning to the athletic club downtown to shower and get ready for work each day. And that went on for several weeks. So that, that grew tiresome after a while. But it's one of the kinds of things that happens when you cannot afford to do all of the renovation before you move in and you have to live through the renovation. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, Fred and Howard before and I know you have uh, great memories of them with the barrel races down Third Street. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. <laughs> they were characters. They always tried to keep us busy and um, always tried to think of ways to bring us together a little bit more closely. And they designed a barrel race. And they, I don't know where they acquired all of these humongous wooden barrels, wine barrels. But uh, Beck Street goes downward, declines somewhat toward, from Mohawk Street toward Third Street. And so they chose that as the site for the barrel race. And um, guys got inside the barrels and other guys rolled the barrels. However, they didn't take into consideration the fact that the bricks are laid in the street in a curve so as to make the water run off to the curbs and drain away. So the barrels constantly bumped into the curbs and so they were constantly straightening up and trying again. No barrels made it all the way to Third Street in that race that day. And some very sore and and hot and tired uh, guys crawled out of those barrels at the end of the race. But it was a lot of fun and people were cheering and and um, it it just was one of those kinds of things that, yep, you knew that was a Fred and a Howard design. And yeah. you know, they planted a tree once in a pothole to try to get the attention of the city to come to German Village and fix the potholes in the street. It took a long time to get bricks laid instead of asphalt filling the potholes. And over the years, our wonderful brick streets have been repaired quite um, conscientiously by the city. Uh, I recall also that you had a story about the Hasfra Haven, the, uh, um, the laundromat there. But... Yes, I was here uh, at the time that Fred and Howard moved in and changed that from a little general store to what it is uh, today. And the, I actually did my laundry in, in Hausfrau Haven's laundromat. And uh, that was another way of bringing the community members together, sitting and chatting, waiting for the laundry. And a lot of people did their laundry in the laundromat then because um, we were all renters and we didn't have our own washer and dryer. And so Fred and Howard moved in to that building and brought a lot of changes. Uh, the, the wine collection was one thing that they initiated. That was, that was a new thing for that store. And then the, the foods gradually went away and the interesting items came in little by little as Fred and Howard created what we now know as Hausfrau Haven. When they first moved in, they would have dinner parties upstairs in their apartment to meet people and to get to know each other better. And I remember my husband and I going, and um, it w we were told that it was a, a dress-up occasion. Mm -hmm. And so oh, maybe a half a dozen of us guests appeared, and Fred and Howard uh, delivered to the table a beautiful silver covered platter, picked up the silver dome, and underneath the cover on this grand platter was a heap of white castles. <laughs> of course, that was just a joke, and then we did have a very fine meal <laughs> following that. But those are the kinds of things that uh, Fred and Howard brought, a lot of humor and a lot of camaraderie, um, just building and bringing people together constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you moved here, Early on, you said that there wasn't a sense of community here, and then over time, you've really it really evolved, mm -hmm. and uh, and that it was 
not just a sense of community, but it was a lot of fun, it sounds like. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Schiller Park um, always was a center of activity, and there, there were, as I recall, a lot of children who gathered at the park and played in the pond in its original uh, fashion. It was um, it was a pond that was not very deep, but it froze over in the winter time so that the children could ice skate mm-hmm. on the pond. And I recall my German Shepherd pulling several children at one time across the pond on their skates, or no skates even. <laughs> Are there other memories that you have that you'd like to share for the oral history? Um, I think I'm kind of getting depleted of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, Nothing additional comes to mind at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you very much. It's been great listening to your stories and hearing about all the amazing things happened during your journey here in German Village. So it's great. Thank you very much, Sandy. You're very welcome. I'm just grateful that God planted me here. Thank you.